Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the webinar, What is Acceptable Air Quality? Um, today, I've got with us Lynette Schmidt, um, Business Development Manager, and Mark Rotaco, Principal Managing Partner, both from Certified Indoor Environmental, and they're going to be sharing with you what is acceptable air quality. This webinar is being presented concurrently in YouTube and Zoom. To ask questions, use the chat to send to all presenters if you're in Zoom. If you're viewing from YouTube, you can use the chat function in YouTube and we will be monitoring that chat as well to share with the presenters. If you're having any issues, please feel free to email uh, info at oregonrealtors.org or call our office. For CE credit, if you have registered for this webinar, your CE is being processed, please, regardless of which platform you're viewing this webinar in, please don't post your name or nerds number to the chat. Thank you and I'll hand it off to Lynette now. There we go, I needed to unmute. Good morning, I wanna thank everyone for attending today's CE class, Indoor Air Quality. Also thank you to Katie with OAR for putting all this together. If you need a packet for today's class, I do have a link I can place for all of you in the chat. Uh, questions are welcome, so please enter them into the chat and I can present those to Mark midway through the presentation and again at the end. Following today's class, uh, Certified will email a link to you with a landing page full of some resources for the class. There's also more information about all of our services at certified.com. Uh, just a little bit about Certified. Uh, we have been in business since 2011. We're locally owned and operated by Mark and Tammy Rotaco. Our area of coverage is Southwest Washington, Portland down to Eugene. In addition to um, indoor air quality and mold remediation, we also offer asbestos abatement and disinfecting services. Uh, we offer free inspections to all real estate brokers and uh, just a fun fact, we have over 500 five-star reviews, which you can check out on our website as well. With that said, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Mark Rotaco. All right. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, our class today on indoor air quality. Uh, this is just kind of a fun class for the real estate community. We don't get a lot of phone calls uh, regarding indoor air quality from the real estate community. Uh, we do do about 75 inspections a week uh, uh, regarding uh, mold up in the attics for the real estate community. But when it comes to indoor air quality, uh, very few phone calls on that uh, issue. But this class gives you a lot of background information on what indoor air quality is and different things that uh, you can learn from it. Got a little disclaimer here. Uh, I'm gonna let you guys uh, read this, give you about 10 seconds, uh, something we need to put into all our presentations uh, just for liability reasons. So if you can take a few seconds and uh, read through that, that'd be great. <clears throat> all right, let's get started today. Uh, we're gonna talk about what IQ is, uh, a little bit about strategies to improve your indoor air quality air testing methods. We're gonna talk a little bit about mold because that really impacts the real estate community. Uh, how to write that repair addendum when you do come across mold. And lastly, we're gonna talk a little bit about our company and gonna have a little section here on disinfecting, uh, some things that you can do to uh, show your property, some checklists, things of that nature that might help you out. So let's talk about what indoor air quality is. I always like to start out with the definition. Uh, the definition just is, refers to air quality within and around buildings, especially as it relates to the health and comfort of the building occupants. And if we can understand the air quality, uh, we can basically control those pollutants indoors and help reduce your risk of indoor health concerns. Some fun facts, uh, or maybe not so fun facts, depending on how you look at it, uh, regarding indoor air quality. Uh, Every day, uh, average American breathes in about 3,000 gallons of air. Uh, that's a lot of air we're breathing in. Uh, we test the water quality on a daily basis to make sure that the water that we're drinking is safe to drink, but we don't check our indoor air quality to make sure that it's safe to breathe. 
Uh, we monitor the outside air quality on a daily basis, uh, but we're not managing the indoor air quality on a daily basis, but we breathe an awful lot of it. Uh, each American spends about 90% of their time indoors. Uh, so obviously we're breathing a lot more of this indoor air quality than outside. And the average indoor air quality is anywhere from two to five times as polluted as the outdoor air. So indoor air obviously is really unhealthy uh, during particular times of the year. And it's important to make sure that we're monitoring that. EPA has listed basically indoor air quality as one of the top five environmental risks to public health. And 99% of all particulates in the air are smaller than one micron and they never settle. They're gonna be floating in the air. They'll never settle because they're just not heavy enough. And then lastly, nearly 96% of all homes have at least one indoor air quality problem. So after today's class, hopefully uh, you'll be able to pinpoint what the issue is in your home and then take corrective action. Uh, this website here down on the left-hand side, uh, airnow.gov, you can go onto that site and look at the outside air quality at any given time during the day. And what the outside air quality, what they're monitoring is the particulate size 2.5 microns. So they're monitoring that level to determine what the quality of air is outside. And you've all got the news reports, you know, we've got a high alert day for poor outside air quality, whether it's rating, relating to forest fires or, or smog or uh, things of that nature. Well, this is a website that monitor it every single uh, minute of the day. And you can go on there and you can check it out. Also monitors our pollen levels to see if we're in a po high pollen uh, level at that particular time. So we're monitoring the outdoor air quality. We do it on a uh, daily basis, but we're not monitoring the indoor. And that's where we spend the majority of our time. And that air in the indoor air quality is much worse than the outdoor air quality. I want you guys to understand a terminology is called particulate matter or PM. Uh, PM is just related to the term for the mixture of solid particles and liquid droplets found in the air. Uh, it's important to understand particulate matter because that's what we measure to determine uh, whether we have a healthy indoor or outdoor environment. Uh, when we talk about particulate matter, a beach sand is about 90 microns in size. The human hair will measure anywhere from 50 to 70 microns in size. Uh, your allergens, like your dust, your pollen, your mold, those are a little bit less than 10 microns. And then your combustible particles, that's what they're measuring outside. That's a 2.5 microns. Uh, so they're really, really small. Now, when we talk about the coronavirus, that's 0.12 microns in diameter. And we always hear on the news, these N95 masks, uh, they actually protect down to 0.1 micron, but they're only 95% efficient down to that size. And that's if they've got a good seal or fit. Most of these masks that people wear uh, don't have a good seal on them. They're not being worn correctly. So even though the mask itself can filter down to 0.1 micron, uh, we're seeing a lot of air gaps uh, on the outside of those face masks. So if they're not worn uh, correctly, they're not as efficient as they need to be. Now, why are we concerned about particulate matter? Uh, the particle size will directly affect your health. So particulate size is important because of those reasons. Uh, small particles, less than 10 microns, can basically go deep into your lungs and some of those particulates can go directly into your bloodstream. And if we're exposed to these, we can really have a effect long-term, short-term over your lungs and your heart and functioning uh, correctly. Uh, a lot of these fine particulates uh, can cause severe heart and lung issues, uh, congestive heart failure, asthma, uh, all sorts of different issues for normal, healthy adults. 
Uh, obviously, children and older adults are at greater risk from PM exposure. If you have an immune compromised system, uh, these fine particulate matters can really affect your health. Uh, some of the health impacts are eye, nose, throat irritation, headaches, uh, aggravation to your coronary respiratory uh, system, uh, premature death uh, if you're really overly exposed. Uh, when we talk about these particulate matter, when you get down to the 2.5 or less, uh, those particulates are so small, they can go directly into your lungs. And some of these particulates are carcinogenic and can lead to cancer or organ failure over time. So it's very important to make sure that you're understanding uh, the size of the particulates and that air quality, because it really has an impact on health effects. Now, according to the EPA, there's three categories of indoor pollutants. Uh, the first one we're gonna talk about is combustion pollutants. These are basically your gases, uh, mostly for indoor homes for residents. It's your gas appliances, uh, those type of devices. Uh, when we talk about VOCs, these are just chemicals that are being released as gases. Uh, think of household products, uh, maybe your paints, your varnishes, uh, those type of things released into the air. Uh, fine particulates get deep into your lungs. And then lastly, when we get most of the calls, because there's some kind of asthma or allergy triggers, uh, so people are sneezing, watery eyes. Uh, these are your molds, your dust mites, your pollen, uh, your pet dander, your asthma allergy triggers. So those are the ones we get the most calls on. Let's talk about carbon monoxide for a second. If your appliance isn't functioning correctly, uh, you can release carbon monoxide into the air. And what I want you to understand basically from this slide here is that low levels of carbon monoxide can really cause fatigue in healthy people. It can cause chest pain, uh, so it can have some significant health issues. As we step up to moderate concentrations, uh, you can end up with some reduced brain function, uh, agina, impaired visions. And then lastly, at higher concentrations, uh, it can lead to death. So our carbon monoxide devices uh, are set at such a high level, it'll only go off at the higher concentrations. So homes can be exposed to moderate concentrations or low concentrations of carbon monoxide and not even realize that they're being exposed to that because the alarms that are in their homes are only gonna go off at the real high levels. So people look at these devices and says, well, I don't have that issue uh, because my carbon monoxide device isn't going off. Well, you can still have moderate or low concentrations. So that's why they suggest annually you should have your appliances uh, checked to make sure that they're uh, running at peak efficiency and you're not getting uh, low or moderate concentration buildup in your homes. We talk about uh, VOCs, uh, volatile organic compounds. Uh, you know, we're really looking at your your paints, uh, your cleaning supplies, varnishes. Uh, pesticides are also an issue. Uh, we had a uh, customer who called us up from the Hillsboro area, and uh, when we arrived at the site, he was living in a tent inside his living room. And he was saying that he was having a reaction and he thought it was, had to be mold, had to be mold. And when we walked in there, there was a distinct chemical odor. And he explained to us that he had used uh, those flea bombs in his home. And now he just didn't use it one time or two times or three times. He used those flea bombs 10 separate times. So obviously, if you're using a product, you're not following the labels, uh, you can have some unintended consequences. And in this case, he had basically put a fine pesticide mist all through the structure. 
every single piece of item had a fine chemical residue. Well, the only way to take care of that is to clean every single portion of that attic. So it's really important that people follow the instructions on these labels. Uh, a lot of the products that people use are carcinogen. Those particles are so small, they go right into the bloodstream. And if you're not paying close attention or using these products in the uh, prescribed manner, you could have unintended consequences and health issues. Uh, one items that people don't really think about when it comes to releasing VOCs is building materials uh, or new carpets or office equipment. All those are fresh uh, and they release an odor and they can off gas for several months. Uh, new cabinetry with the varnishes and the glues, those can off gas over a period of time. So they just don't go away right away. So those issues uh, can cause severe chemical reactions to people that are sensitized to chemicals. So we run into people all the time that think maybe they have a mold allergy or things of that nature. It's really they're having a chemical reaction to something in the house. So VOCs evaporate in the air. Uh, they can irritate your eye, nose, throat, cause headaches, nausea. Uh, again, the fine particles go directly into your bloodstream and it can lead to damage to your liver, your kidneys, and your nervous system. And then some can even cause cancer. We get more calls on this portion than anything else. Uh, people are calling up, you know, I'm having some asthma allergy uh, triggers. Uh, can you come and do a uh, mold test? And just the fact that they don't have any visible mold, they haven't had a water event, the likelihood of them having a mold issue is really, really small. But they're always calling, let's do a mold test. And that's really not quite the method that they should do. That would not be the first test to see what's causing their indoor air pollution. So different sources of uh, allergy triggers is pollen, dust mites, pet dander, mold is an allergen trigger, and so is cigarette smoke. So those are some of the issue. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, dust mites. I'll play you a short video here. Uh, now it's time to zoom into the microscopic world of the tiny creatures that inhabit our everyday lives. There's nothing like collapsing into a freshly made bed at the end of a long, hard day. Crisp sheets, plump pillows, a warm, clean place where you can escape the grime and the grind of day-to-day -day existence. Or can you? Just how clean is your bed? Well, you might be horrified at the things you can sleep with. Meet Harry and his chums. Harry's a dust mite, or Dermatophagoides terenicinus. Try saying that 10 times quickly. He's an ugly sucker, but fortunately, you'll never come face to face with him. At just 0.2 to 0.3 of a millimetre long, it's virtually impossible to see him with the naked eye. And he'll certainly never see you because he hasn't got any eyes. In the average bed, there can be anything from 100,000 to 2 million dust mites. It's extraordinary. And a two-year-old pillow, the weight of it, 10% of it, could be dead mites and their excretions. Yeah. And you know what they live on? Dead skin cells. Yeah, if it wasn't for them, we'd probably be waving round in dead skin. Well, they do a great job. Yeah, good housekeepers. Mm. Bye, Harry. Keep up the good work. Good night. Sleep tight. Oh. Uh, dust mites. Probably the uh, most common allergy and asthma trigger. Uh, people don't really think about dust mites uh, causing an allergy issue, but it's one of the most common out there. Uh, they feed on human skin flakes. Uh, they tend to thrive when we have 40% humidity and above 70 degrees. Uh, Northwest, we're perfectly set up for that type of weather uh, conditions in our homes. Uh, but what do you do? How do you get rid of them? 
Uh, they're not just in your beds or your pillows. They're in all soft furnishings. So they could be in your couches. They could be in your desk. They can be in your pillows. As the uh, video said there, 10% of your pillows could be uh, dust mites and their excretions. So how often are you changing your pillows out? Uh, they recommend uh, getting new pillows once a year. Uh, you can always do what uh, we do in our household. We buy ourselves new pillows every year and we give our old ones uh, to our guest room. I'm just kidding. Uh, but you should be changing your pillows out every year. And it's not just from dust mites. Uh, over the course of a year, uh, you're going to excrete out of your mouth through drool and so forth. Uh, that moisture source, it gets into your pillows and you can have other viruses, bacteria, mold from that also. So one of the things I recommend, uh, get some allergen proof in casings. Uh, you can get pillows uh, for about $10 for a set of two, uh, mattress coverings for under $30 for your mattress and box springs. Uh, so you can at least cover those materials. You can also, uh, they recommend washing your linens in hot water uh, every seven to 10 days. So those will all help reduce uh, your uh, dust mite issue. Also uh, vacuum, uh, you know, vacuum is very important. And it's very important that you have a vacuum that has a good HEPA filter on it. Uh, that'll take care of the dust mites. You can vacuum your mattresses. Uh, if you have uh, children or grandchildren with stuffed toys, you can put those in a freezer, uh, put them in there for three to five hours per week. That'll also kill the dust mites. Uh, make sure you're changing your uh, furnace filter. Uh, do that regularly. Uh, if you have a high pleated filter, that'll also help with uh, eliminating the dust mites also. So those are some of the things. Number one allergen trigger. Always get calls with people saying, I wake up in the morning, I don't feel as refreshed. A lot of the reason for that is they haven't made their bedroom a clean room. And there's different ways to make sure that your room is clean and healthy so that you have the best air quality in that particular room. And we'll cover that in a little bit. All right, strategies to improve the indoor air quality. Uh, the number one and most cost effective method is source control, uh, improving your ventilation, and then lastly, uh, air cleaners. Uh, we find that most homeowners can tackle probably 95% of the indoor air quality issues on their own. They really don't need to bring in a professional company like us to deal with that. Uh, most of the time when we go out and we look at somebody who is complaining about an allergen trigger, uh, what we're finding is there's no mold there. Uh, we're finding really an environment that is a cleaning issue. There's a fine level of dust throughout the house. Uh, there's a lot of clothing and so forth on the floor. Uh, all that affects the air quality in the house. They may not have really good uh, changing their furnace filters. So a lot of those things is a maintenance, a cleanliness issue, rather than necessarily bringing in a professional to put in big, huge, expensive air cleaners. So most homeowners can do a lot of this maintenance on their own. When we talk about source control, we just wanna eliminate sources of pollution uh, or reduce their emissions inside the house. Uh, an example would be people who are using uh, household cleaners. Uh, those cleaners are releasing VOCs into the air. Uh, you can control that by getting organic cleaners that are low VOCs or no VOC uh, cleaners. Uh, so there are different things that you can take on your own. Uh, your gas stoves and furnaces, you can have those inspected annually to make sure you're decreasing emissions. Uh, pollen, you know, has issues. Uh, if it's a high pollen day, you want to keep your windows and doors closed so you're not cross-contaminating with pollen from outside to the indoor. So you can control uh, the sources of exposures inside your house so that you don't have to then uh, ventilate or uh, clean through uh, uh, air cleaners.
Now we're talking about uh, improving our ventilation. Uh, basically what this is going to do is reduce your levels of contaminants. Uh, so it improves the indoor air quality. Uh, number one way uh, and cost-effective method of doing this is simply by opening up your windows uh, two to three hours a week, uh, every other day uh, to bring in fresh air from outside and basically dilute the poor indoor air quality. So bringing in fresh air uh, will overall improve your air quality inside the home, but it's really important you're doing it on a consistent basis and making sure that you're going to the airnow.gov site to make sure it's a good air quality day. So there are some times during the summer where their air quality is really poor outside. And so we don't wanna take that air quality and uh, dilute it with the good indoor air quality. So open up your windows, uh, use your bathroom, kitchen fans, all those will help with the indoor air quality. One of the things that some higher end homes are starting to install is a uh, on their HVAC system, their furnace system. Uh, most furnace systems today are recycling the indoor air quality. So it's basically, instead of pulling fresh air from outside and filtering it, they're pulling and using the recycled air from the inside of the house. Higher end homes are installing systems where they're actually bringing in their fresh air from outside, they're filtering that, and then circulating that and diluting the uh, air quality. Uh, they do this in office buildings. Uh, they have to dilute it with the outdoor air quality, but we're starting to do that with the indoor air quality, pull in that fresh air from outside rather than recirculating the indoor air quality. So that's another method of improving the air and air quality. Uh, air filters are very important uh, for your furnace. Uh, air filters have what we call a minimum efficiency reporting value or MERV rating. Those ratings go anywhere from one to 20. The higher the rating, the more effective they are as far as filtering out uh, particulates. Uh, MERV 8 rating is gonna filter out your pollen, your dust, your dust mites, uh, debris, pet dander, if you step it up to a MERV 11, it'll also get your mold spores, uh, some car fumes and smog. A MERV 13 will do everything from smoke, bacteria, virus carriers, uh, and microscopic allergens. So the higher the MERV rating, the more effective uh, they are as far as filtering out indoor air pollutants. Now, be very, very careful. Don't all of a sudden go out and, and get a MERV 15 for your furnace because the higher that MERV rating is, it reduces the airflow uh, to that furnace. And if you restrict that airflow and your furnace isn't designed for it, you can overheat your blower motor and cause some serious issues with your furnace. So a high MERV rating is important, but it's also make sure it is uh, rated for your particular furnace. Uh, Get this question all the time, how often should I change my furnace filters? Uh, the EPA says you should be doing it every three months. I think there's some practicality of when you should be looking at changing that furnace. Uh, things that you look at, uh, if I have a one inch MERV 8 and I have a one inch MERV 13, well, the MERV 13 is going to uh, clog up faster than the MERV 8 because it's collecting more particulate matter. So I may have to change that filter more often than a MERV 8. If I have a really dusty environment, I may have to change the furnace in that house uh, more often than if I have a really clean environment, I may not have to change it as often. Uh, also, some of these furnaces have like a four or five inch filter. Well, I'm not gonna have to change that filter as often as I will a one inch. So I always recommend people get in the habit of changing it every three months or at least inspecting that furnace filter. And based on uh, your lifestyle, uh, your environment, you may have to change it more often or less often depending on your household. So get in the habit of checking it every three months and then 
changing it according to your lifestyle. Vacuums. Vacuums are important. Uh, just think of them as an air processing machine. Uh, we get these vacuums. We think we're doing a great job. I'm vacuuming my house. What you're really doing is throwing up in the air all the particulates that are on that floor that have been percolating uh, for a week or a couple of weeks, depending on how often you vacuum uh, your house. Uh, all that goes back up into the air if you don't have a good quality vacuum. Uh, a lot of people have vacuums that have a uh, vacuum bag in it. And I always like to ask the question, how often do you change that vacuum bag? And obviously the typical answer is, well, I change it when it's full. And people who have a vacuum with a vacuum bag always will notice that if they have a vacuum for a week and they plug it back in, they all of a sudden get this odor released back up into the air. And that's from all the dust, dirt, debris, viruses, bacteria, dust mites, uh, mold, uh, spores percolating in that vacuum bag. Uh, so that'll release it all up back into the air. So it's important to have a good vacuum uh, so that when you do vacuum, uh, you're minimizing the release of the particulates back up into the air. Uh, some really good systems for people that have allergens are what I call a sealed system. Uh, the Prolax and the Mealy is really, really good systems out there. Uh, so those are good sealed systems for people that have allergen issues. Uh, a couple bagless systems uh, that are out there, the Dyson Upright works pretty good. Uh, the Shark Navigators has a pretty good high rating. Uh, that's the one I, I use. Uh, I like the uh, bagless ones only because I can empty them uh, after each use, uh, wipe them out. So I'm getting all the particulates out there. Uh, so I like those uh, for personal use. Obviously, professionally, we're using a very high end uh, HEPA vacuum, uh, which is, is a high efficiency uh, vacuum that we're using. So those are a couple of different types out there. Uh, it's well worth the money to invest in a good vacuum and use it. Well, I'll talk a little bit about uh, portable air cleaners, some five facts about them. Uh, the first one is there's many types of air cleaners out there. So we started out with source control, uh, then we moved on to diluting the air. Now we're really talking about how do we clean the air? Uh, and those things are you know, your furnace filters, your vacuums, and now we're really talking about uh, bringing in a portable air cleaner to scrub the air of the particulates. So if we can reduce those particulates, obviously that's good for our health and overall uh, comfort level. So make sure when you're looking at air cleaners, uh, you're just not buying a really inexpensive tabletop model. Uh, they range from those all the way up to really expensive whole house systems. Some air cleaners are highly effective uh, while others uh, are not very efficient at all. So they all have ratings just like the MERV systems do. And it's important to get one that is designed for your purposes. Uh, most air cleaners don't remove any gases uh, pollutants. So if you want to include that, you need to make sure that the air cleaner is rated to also move those type of pollutants in your, your air. Um, so effectiveness, uh, strength of the pollutant source, you know, what are you really trying to accomplish? If you're just trying to reduce the particulates out there or you're trying to do something in addition to that. So that's what you wanna look at. Uh, all of them will have ratings out there. Make sure that the uh, one that you get is rated for that size of a room. A tabletop is not going to scrub a whole bedroom. It's only gonna get that little area there. You want one that's rated for that room and one that's rated to filter down to 0.3 microns at a certain efficiency. The other mistake when people get these portable air cleaners, they don't uh, then uh, change the filters. You gotta change the filters on these just like you change the filters on your furnace. So that's the other mistake that people make. Highly effective, very useful for in your bedrooms to keep that as your clean room 
uh, so you wake up refreshed in the morning. Uh, I'd like to talk about air duct cleaning. Uh, it's really interesting when I talk to realtors when it comes to air duct cleaning and how often we should clean our air ducts. And I get everything from annually, you should clean your air ducts uh, to no. And so what's the real answer? And there's been some studies out there. Uh, the EPA uh, has done a study on the effectiveness of air duct cleaning and they came up with one conclusion. And then you have the Air Duct Cleaning Association, which has done their own studies. Guess what happened? They don't match. Uh, EPA doesn't, didn't come up to the same conclusion as the Air Duct Cleaning Association. So who's right? Uh, when should we clean our air ducts and how often? Uh, so according to EPA, duct cleaning has never been shown to prevent health problems. Uh, it actually increases the air quality, the dirty air uh, actually will increase the uh, air quality in the, your, your air. So if you have your air ducts cleaned immediately afterwards, it's gonna release into the air a huge amount of particulates. Uh, the reason for that is uh, when those scrubbers go through, uh, it has just released all the fine particulates and as soon as you turn that fan, that fan in, it just releases all those particulates back up into the air. Uh, it's also been shown that cleaning your air ducts uh, doesn't overall uh, decrease uh, uh, the air quality afterwards. Uh, that, that pollutants uh, still can cause greater exposure uh, than the dirty air ducts. There's no benefit in cleaning them uh, from the EPA standpoint. No evidence that a light amount of household dust or other particular matter in the air poses any additional risk to health. So the EPA doesn't recommend that air ducts be cleaned except on an as needed basis. Uh, so they don't really see a benefit. All of their studies haven't shown a benefit, but I think we can kind of draw some conclusions. When it talks about as needed, uh, if I was a homeowner and I'm moving into a new uh, home I just recently purchased, I'm probably going to have my air ducts clean. And the reason for that is I don't know how well the previous homeowner maintained their furnace system. They may not have even had a, a filter uh, between their furnace and their ducts. Uh, they may have had pets. I don't know what their lifestyle was. So... I may want to start with a clean base, have those air ducts clean prior to even moving in. That way I'm starting off with a fresh system. Now, once those air ducts have been cleaned and I maintain that filter, then I'm not gonna need to clean my air ducts again because all those particulates are being filtered out by the filter that I have rather than getting into my duct work. So, probably one time, and then I'm probably not gonna clean those filters again because I'm maintaining it with my furnace filter. Another reason why people I uh, hear clean their ducts is well, we have pets and so forth. Uh, again, that's gonna be filtered out by your furnace filter. Uh, you can personally vacuum out your ducts uh, by yourself. You don't necessarily have to have someone come in and clean the whole system. Uh, because again, the furnace filter is going to do that for you. And then lastly, depending if you're having a remodel done, uh, if you have a contractor that's not doing a good job uh, with dust control, you can actually increase uh, the amount of particulates. And if you're not monitoring that filter, it can get into your duct system. So those are some of the exceptions or reason as needed that might need to be done. But to just routinely do it every single year, you know, uh, EPA has found no benefit uh, for that. All right, let's get into some testing methods. Uh, people call us up all the time for mold testing. Uh, we're gonna go into a couple uh, different methods to test for mold. Uh, there's a spore trap analysis. ERMI is starting to gain some popularity and there's some real reasons why you shouldn't perform that test. Uh, home test kits, and then how do we check we're into our air quality? It's really through a laser particle counter. Let's talk about these for a second. 
Uh, when it comes to mold sampling, uh, they use a spore trap. Uh, I understand out there that there are no federal limits uh, or EPA guidelines of how much mold in the air causes a health issue. So there's no limits. Uh, they have limits for asbestos fibers, but nothing when it comes to mold at all. So we're doing testing out there and we're sampling the air, uh, but there's nothing to compare it to to see whether it's safe or not because there's no standard out there. Uh, everybody reacts differently to mold. So it's really difficult to determine what is actually gonna cause a health hazard. So we can't get that standard. And since there are no standards, uh, we don't know when we do air sampling, whether or not it's hazardous or not. So spore trap testing uh, has many errors. Uh, it's really a tool, but it's really not the best method to determine overall air quality of a building. It's really designed to see if we may have some elevated mold in the structure. And even at that, we can't really determine whether or not it's a health issue because there's no standard to look at. Uh, here's the device that they use on the left-hand side. Uh, this is a aerosol cassette. Uh, when we break this cassette down in the middle there, you can see a slide. Uh, we pull usually 75 liters of air through this slide and that slide has some stickum on it. That slide will collect particulate matter, including mold spores. The reason why they chose 75 liters of air is because that's what the asbestos industry does. They take 75 liters of air to see if you have elevated asbestos fibers in the air. And they thought, ah, oh, if they do it for the asbestos industry, let's just do it for the mold industry. No real reason, just ah, oh, makes sense. We'll just try it that way. So they'll then send that off to a lab. Uh, they'll break that apart. They'll put that slide underneath a microscope. They'll blow it up on a big screen TV. And then they'll pay somebody minimum wage to manually count the number of spores on that slide. Pretty tedious, a uh, lot of room for human error, as you can imagine. Uh, is the person doing it first thing in the morning or are their eyes tired in the afternoon? Uh, not a very scientific method, a lot of human error. The EPA basically uh, did this type of sampling, sent it off to labs all across the United States after taking a base sample in the middle of a room uh, and took 50 of them, sent it all over the place. They got a 30% variance uh, from that same sample uh, from the same room. So a lot of human error. Uh, we also don't know uh, if you take a sample in the morning and then you take one in the afternoon, you're gonna get different results. Uh, if you take a sample in one corner of the room and another sample in another corner of the room, you're gonna get different sample, different results. On the right-hand side is a sample report. Uh, again, we have this report. It tells us the total fungi count. It tells us the species that they've been trying to identify off that uh, slide. Uh, but I can't go anywhere to determine whether this is a pass or a fail. There's no standard on whether it's elevated or not. I have to go my own by my own experience. So it's really inconclusive. Uh, mold testing through the ERMI method. Uh, this is a, according to the EPA, for scientific purposes only. It's not uh, a method that we would normally use uh, to start out with to see if there's a mold issue. It's probably a test that we would never recommend unless we're trying to do some forensic uh, studies. So it's for scientific purposes only. But there's a lot of labs out there that are marketing this, saying it's the next greatest, best thing, uh, but EPA, scientific purposes only. Uh, here's how it works. They're gonna send you out to the homeowner uh, kit. The kit will have latex gloves, a microfiber cloth, and then they want you to go and dust and find a gram of dust uh, and then send it off to the lab. Then they'll then anal analyze it, and inside dust, you're gonna have mold spores, so it'll generate a report to you. Uh, 
really no uh, method. Uh, everybody dusts differently. You may end up with a home that has a lot of dust in it. You may end up with a home with less dust uh, and get completely different results. Doesn't mean you have a mold issue. You may have an issue with cleanliness uh, rather than a mold issue, but you'll get a report. It'll say you have mold there. And again, there's no standard on whether it's a pass or a fail. Uh, one of my favorite ones is the mold test kits uh, that you can get at Home Depot. I get homeowners calling me all the time or tenants call me all the time. Uh, I got this report back and it says I have mold. Well, they went to Home Depot, they got this test kit. That test kit has a media in it that's designed to do what? It's designed to grow mold. So if I put uh, a test kit out there that's designed to grow mold, and in the air, right now, you guys are breathing mold spores. Well, those mold spores are gonna sit on that media and they're gonna grow. So here I have a media that's designed to grow mold. I'm gonna get mold. Doesn't mean I have a mold issue, but I'll get a report showing mold is there. I might as well take a piece of bread and set it out. What are you gonna get? You're gonna get mold on that bread. That's the same thing here. Doesn't mean you have a mold issue. It's just that you put something out that's designed to grow mold. So uh, we kind of dismiss those when those come in. Uh, they're meaningless from our standpoint as far as evaluating if there's any mold issue. Because that, without moisture, you'll never have mold growth. So how do we really do indoor air quality? Uh, those are all for mold. They really don't tell us whether or not we have healthy indoor air. Uh, they just kind of are indicative whether or not uh, there's a mold issue, uh, but you really need to do some more in depth. Probably the best way to determine whether you have an indoor air quality issue is through the use of a laser particle counter. Uh, there's an actual standard out there to determine whether or not uh, you have elevated particulates and whether it's safe uh, to be in that structure. Uh, just like outside, we get these alerts on high smog days that it's not safe to be outside. The same thing that they're doing on the indoors with these devices. Uh, so we can test actually five areas for people and one outdoor, and we can send it off uh, and get a independent uh, report to see whether or not it met the uh, clean indoor air environment. I'm sure all of you have heard of the terminology of a clean room. Well, there is a clean room uh, chart out there that's designed to determine whether it's safe to do manufacturing, uh, to whether it's safe to do perform surgery, and to make sure whether or not uh, you have healthy indoor air. Uh, this is a standard. Uh, it's an accepted standard throughout the world, and we can meet those standards with a laser particle counter. So an ISO-4 is basically a class 10. That's the standard for uh, being able to perform surgery. So in surgical rooms, they take a laser particle counter, they check that air quality to make sure it's safe to perform surgery. And ISO 8 is for healthy indoor air. So we can monitor the indoor air just like they do outside, just like they do for clean rooms, just like they do for surgery and see if it's met a certain standard. Uh, here's an example of a report. On the left-hand side, we've got elevated levels uh, level nine is elevated. We wanna get it down to a level eight or below, which is what the after treatment is. So we've met the international standard for healthy indoor air. <clears throat> Let's go over some tips for homeowners uh, when it comes to uh, indoor air quality. Uh, the number one issue I see more than anything when people are complaining about uh, allergens or air quality issues, it's mostly a cleaning issue. Uh, you know, most people should go in and have a deep clean done a couple times a year. Uh, that removes all those particulates that are really allergen triggers. Uh, you know, clean your bedding, uh, change your uh, pillows out once a year. Uh, if you have pets, groom them regularly. This all improves your indoor air quality. Uh, you don't need a professional company coming in to do that. Uh, you can do that normally on your own or get a good housekeeper and have them do it uh, for you once a month. Uh, the second thing is ventilate, get fresh air coming in, uh, change your uh, filters. 
All those things are very, very important. Uh, get a good vacuum, uh, vacuum regularly. All those, again, removes all the particulates out of the air and improves your uh, air quality. Obviously your filters are important. Make sure you're changing those regularly. And then lastly, uh, we didn't talk a little bit about it, but control your humidity, uh, use your bathroom fans, keep your humidity down, uh, that'll avoid any kind of mold growth. So these are things that all homeowners can do. You don't necessarily need to bring in a professional company to do that. Uh, we've got some more time. Do we have any questions so far? Hey, Mark. Uh, right now, we don't have any questions. If you have questions, feel free to put those in the chat. Okay. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, mold. Uh, just kind of a refresher for you. Got a few minutes here. Uh, a lot of transactions that we got, the homeowner, when they call up, the home inspection calls out mold. Uh, there are certain ways that you should properly remediate mold. Uh, and when we, we're gonna be doing a mold class here in a couple of days through OAR. Uh, so you might wanna attend it. We go into really depth of mold, but there are some standards out there. Uh, according to the CDC, the EPA, you wanna remove mold from the structure. You just don't wanna kill it. Uh, the reason for that is dead mold is still allergenic. Uh, and some dead molds are potentially toxic. The second thing you wanna do is fix the water problem. And lastly, don't paint over the mold. We get a lot of repair addendums in, and it's basically telling uh, the seller, hire a professional mold remediation contractor to remove the mold. I want everybody to understand there's no such thing in the state of Oregon. Uh, you don't need to be licensed to be a mold uh, remediation company in Oregon you don't have to have any formal trainer. So when you put professional mold remediation contractor, that actually means nothing to my industry. But you're putting that in there because you think you're protecting your buyer. The second thing that we notice is probably really missing on most repair addendums. There's nothing on there to identify the source of the cause. What's causing this mold? You know, And if you're not fixing the cause, guess what's gonna happen? It's gonna come back. So sellers aren't gonna to pay to fix it if you haven't put it in the repair addendum. They're just gonna have it remediated and it's gonna come back. Uh, it may come back in three years, may come back in a year. It really depends. So be aware of that. We're gonna give you some guidelines really quick on how to deal with it. Uh, most of the time, 95% plus of the time when you guys have mold, it's gonna be attic mold. And the number one reason is because of condensation and lack of adequate ventilation up in the attic uh, or improperly vented bathroom fans and dryer vents. So you need to make sure that it's ventilated correctly uh, because of those issues. Uh, so that's important to be done. And here's an attic, uh, brand new rough. Uh, this is five months later because I didn't ventilate the attic. So all this mold growth here happened within five months because of a very inadequately vented attic, brand new rub. So methods of attic mold removal, uh, we have your sanders and painters. They're gonna sand and scrape the wood framing. Then they're gonna apply a uh, something to kill the mold. That's really a commercial pesticide. Lastly, they're gonna uh, paint over everything Basically, they're covering up the mold. So that's not really the best method to remove the mold. There are better methods out there. Uh, when they put protective barriers on that, mold will grow right through it or right on it, uh, depending on when they apply it. Uh, again, here's some pictures of mold just growing right on that protective barrier. You've got to fix the moisture source, otherwise it's going to come back. So if you work with certified and it comes to mold, we're gonna identify the cause, uh, we're gonna remove it. Uh, we have the ability to put a protective coating on it. We'd rather fix the cause, which is ventilation, but sometimes we'll provide a protective coating. It's clear, we don't hide anything. So everybody that's using a white paint could use a clear coating. They just choose not to because they're trying to uh, clear it up. A quick video here kind of shows our process to remove the attic mold. Uh, this is all real time and it's not so good instantaneously removing the mold. So 
real quick process. Uh, when we're done, uh, there's actually no mold uh, left in the app. It's gone completely. Here's some before and after pictures of that. So brand new looking plywood after we were done uh, doing the remediation. Uh, this will be in your handout. I'll just go over it really quick. Uh, so we'll have a link to this on our website on how to write the repair data to protect your uh, buyer. So most people just put the bottom portion on there. Motor remediation can be performed by certified indoor environmental. Uh, that's the best terminology you guys can use out there. I've never had any issues when people put that in there. Uh, repair data. All right. Let's move on here. Uh, today, I just want to tell you a little bit about the coronavirus, uh, some of the challenges that brokers are going through, uh, some of the pain points that we're hearing uh, from buyers and sellers. Uh, a lot of sellers are holding off listing their homes, obviously, right now. Uh, they got a fear of uh, less buyer traffic. Uh, a lot of them have, are staying at home uh, because of the stay at home orders. Uh, they're working remotely, so it's difficult uh, for them to vacate. A lot of buyers don't want to go into homes right at the moment uh, for fear of uh, the coronavirus. So there's a lot of apprehension out there. Uh, so moving forward, you know, what are the things that you can do to alleviate some of those concerns? Uh, we have some things or possible solutions you may consider. Uh, obviously, virtual tours are the best way to go. If you can do those, it's not always uh, able to do that. Uh, we have some checklists uh, on our website. You'll get some links to uh, for your buyers, things that they should consider when they're, they're going into homes uh, to protect themselves and also things that the sellers should do also. So uh, take advantage of those checklists uh, that we have for you. Uh, there's also some guidelines on disinfecting uh, a home. Uh, the most important thing is to do a clean with a soap and water. That's the most important thing you can do. You hear about people, oh, I'm disinfecting, I'm applying a disinfectant. The disinfectant is not near as effective if you haven't cleaned first. Uh, you gotta remove that biofilm that's on all surfaces before you uh, apply that disinfectant. So it's critical to put a plan together. Uh, we do do disinfecting uh, for uh, commercial real estate, and we're basically gonna wipe to clean that surface. So it's a cleaning process. We're then gonna go in, we're gonna fog the whole uh, structure. This gets that disinfectant throughout the environment. Lastly, we're gonna test. We're not testing to see if the coronavirus is there. We're just basically testing to see if we clean that surface to hospital grade standard. And that's what we're doing. So those are different methods to do. Uh, again, we have some uh, worksheets out there uh, for you guys to utilize. We also have some packages out there uh, which you can purchase or put in the repair denim. Uh, a lot of times if you're moving into a new structure, it's been vacant for 72 hours. Well, the virus is what they understand is usually only active for 72 hours. So if it's been vacant for 72 hours, it's probably pretty safe to go in probably not as much exposure to the virus. So you may just be able to clean that on your own with your house cleaners. And then maybe a higher risk to come in and just fog the structure afterwards uh, so that it's a better, safer product uh, or home for somebody new buyer to move into. So we do have some gift certificates available. We've got a lot of uh, realtors taking advantage of this for their uh, customers. Uh, they're giving them this gift for us to come in and either do a thorough clean or just maybe just a fog uh, prior to moving in. So that's helping with their transactions. Uh, okay, lastly, why use us? We're a general contractor, we're licensed, bonded, and insured. We do free inspections on your properties. We're gonna be out there within 24 to 48 hours. Usually you'll get on the spot estimates. Uh, one of the things about our company, you guys can pay out of escrow. We're not gonna say, hey, pay us 50% down to balance out of escrow. You can just pay us out of escrow. Uh, we're cost effective. I don't see anybody less than us when it comes to the remediation portion of any estimates. Um, we may see people less than us because they're not ventilating properly, uh, but we do price match. So give us an opportunity to do us. As Lynette stated earlier, we have over 500 five-star reviews. 
We're very proud of that. Uh, very proud of giving customer service. Uh, we have a great team out there for you guys. Uh, we do a lot of different things. Uh, so reach out to us if you have questions, use us as a resource, uh, we're available. And then finally, we're pretty much done with the presentation. Do we have any additional questions? Anybody out there have any questions for Mark? I don't see any in the chat, Mark. I think we're good. Here are some uh, resources. EPA is a great resource when it comes to mold or indoor air quality. Uh, they have a great uh, article on air duct cleaning uh, that they did. So if you wanna read up on that, just do EPA and type in air duct cleaning. They've got a great summary of their uh, studies. Uh, CDC has great information uh, regarding uh, the coronavirus and uh, other questions you may have. So with that, Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, I'll turn it back over to uh, OAR. And thank you very much for having us today. Thank you so much, Mark and Lynette, for being here. And everybody, you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.